Good morning. I'm happy to open this concluding session uh, with the lecture of Pavel uh, Pavlovich. We all know him by now, but nevertheless, I will introduce him uh, briefly. Uh, professor Pavel Pavlovich is a professor of medieval Arabo-Islamic civilization at the Department of Arabic and Semitic Studies, Faculty of Classical and Modern uh, Philology at Sofia University. Uh, he holds a BA degree and a, a BA degree from history from Baghdad University, an MA, PhD, and Doctor uh, of Science degrees from the University of Sofia. Uh, Pavel Pavlovich works and publishes uh, in the fields of history of the Arabs before Islam, methodology of study, uh, of studying early Islam, early Islamic law and exegesis, and development of the early criticism of Muslim traditional hadith. He is a contributor to the Encyclopedia of Islam and, and, uh, and the author of many other uh, contributions. Uh, his forthcoming uh, work is Muslim Ben al Hajjaj and Naisaburi, the skeptical tradition, a traditionalist. And he will be talking to us today on the topic uh, Islam, Isnad, Isnad cum Maten analysis, achievements, limitations, and perspectives. Please. Thank you, Professor Bar Asher, for. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, for... Can you raise your voice, please? Yes, I will. Thank you for this introduction. And uh, I, was, I also should uh, like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this event. Uh, I must uh, admit that uh, it was my dream to take part in the Jahiliya to Islam conference since the end of, uh, of the 1990s. So I'm very grateful that I'm here for a second time in succession. And uh, I also would uh, like uh, uh, to uh, express my gratitude for um, the suggestion on behalf of the organizers to talk about uh, uh, a method that is known as Isnat Kumatan analysis. Uh, after initially sending a rather dull um, uh, title of my talk, uh, I decided to rename it uh, to something more catchy. Uh, but the content is the same. Uh, so the present name is Hadith Studies and the Principle of Uncertainty. Can we reconcile Isnat, Matan, and Early Chronology? Traditions, Hadith, are the chief source of legal rules, exegetical principles, and moral norms in Islam. Usually associated with the Prophet Muhammad and the first two generations of Muslims, known as the companions, Sahaba, and the successors, Tabi'un, the Hadith appear to hold, to hold abundant information about the early history of Islam, either in the form of historical descriptions of the Prophet's life and the conquests, this is known as the Sira Marazi literature, or as a historicizing preface to prophetic pronouncements on legal and exegetical matters. The present day historians of early Islam, Muslim jurisprudence and theology, rely on hadith as the main repository of information for their scholarly studies. All the same, the utility of Muslim traditions as objective historical witnesses is a vexed question. Systematic hadith criticism began towards the end of the second 
8th century, driven by the efforts of Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, ibn Ma'in, and ibn al-Madini. Throughout the 3rd, 9th century, Hadith scholarship was advanced by Ibn Hanbal, Al-Bukhari, Muslim Ibn Al-Hajjaj al naysaburi Al-Tirmidhi, Al-Jujjani, to mention a few. They authored works on the principles of Hadith criticism, such as Muslims' famous Muqaddimah to the Sahih and Al-Tirmidhi's Kitab Al-Ilal as well as collections devoted to the evaluation of transmitters, ilm al-rijal. From early on, Muslim hadith critics focused their attention on the evaluation of the lines of transmission, the isnads. Thus, Ibn al-Madini, who died in 233, observed that the second 8th century isnads Yaduru turn on six early transmitters who were active in Khurasan, Iraq, Syria, and the Arabian Peninsula. So here is a diagram which I made based upon Ibn al-Madini's typology of is not pivots or pivotal transmitters. So in Red color, you can see his first generation of six pivots. Then in blue, you see the second generation of pivots. And finally, in green, there is the third generation of pivots. And uh, if you wonder why some of these transmitters are connected with different type of type of lines, whereas others are not. This is because of Ibn al-Madini. In certain cases, he mentions the informants of one or another madar, and in other cases, he doesn't mention such informants. And interestingly, he doesn't mention the informants of this first generation of Madars, which uh, flourished, as you can see, at the end of the first and the beginning of the second century Hijra. While paying prime attention to the Isnad, Muslim traditionists and Hadith critics considered it not in isolation, but in conjunction with the Hadith's textual part, the Matan. Usually, you can see in a number of studies the statement that Muslim Hadith critics were exclusively focused on the Isnat, but this is not the case. They treat the Hadith as an integral unit of text and line of transmission. Specific textual features or unparalleled texts were detected by collating the chains of transmission in a cluster of similar texts. Isnad comparison allowed the Hadith critic to associate each peculiar formulation, point of difference, or contradiction with a particular transmitter who was deemed responsible for their circulation. The science of transmitters, which explored various aspects of personal reliability, became crucial for determining whether textual peculiarities reflect honest transmission or camouflage a willful intention to endorse juristic, theological, and sectarian bias. The matin of a tradition alone, however, however quirky it might seem, was insufficient for according preponder preponderance to one textual variant over the others. It was the Isnad's quantitative comparison and the personal evaluation of transmitters that clinched such cases. And herein, lies the main difference between the traditional hadith analysis 
and the modern day is not and mutton scrutiny. The foundations of modern Hadith scholarship were laid in the 19th century by a cohort of great scholars, including William Muir, Muir Alois Sprenger, and Ignaz Goldzia. These scholars appreciated the evidentiary promise of the Isnat while dismissing the methods of traditional Hadith criticism as largely incapable of sorting reliable from unreliable traditions. The 19th century historians of early Islam studied exclusively the Matan, whose text and composition they considered indicative of belonging to an identifiable historical setting. Attention to the Isnad was reinvigorated only in 1950 with the publication of Josef Schacht's seminal work, The Origins of Muhammadan Jurisprudence. One of Schacht's groundbreaking observation reminds of Ibn al-Madini's pivotal transmitters. If one draws the Isnad of a given tradition on a graphical diagram, they will converge on a key figure, mostly belonging to the second or the third generation after the Prophet Muhammad. So here is such a diagram. Without, it is not based on a, an actual uh, hadith. Uh, it is only a schematic diagram. So here is this pivotal transmitter on whom the Isnats mostly, as you see, converge. I'll come to the other terms later. Schacht dubbed this key figure the common link. Unlike Ibn al-Madini, who only noted the existence of such key transmitters, Schacht drew from the same observation epistemological conclusions. To him, the common link is either the tradition's original disseminator or someone whose name was used and frequently misused by later transmitters. During the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, Schacht's method was refined by Josef van S. and Gautier Yainbo. To Yainbo, we owe the introduction of several new terms, such as partial common link, here and here, and also spider and dive. I will explain shortly these terms. An important methodological advance was marked by the works of Iftikhar Zaman and Harald Motzki. Whereas Schacht and Yainbo were primarily concerned with Isnad analysis, Zaman and Motsky shifted the focus of to the matins, which they studied in close conjunction with the chain of transmission. Motsky christianed the new method Isnad Kummatan analysis. And uh, I shall emphasize the contribution of Iftikhar Zaman because uh, he is uh, frequently disregarded. Uh, he is the author of a groundbreaking PhD thesis defended uh, in Chicago in 1991. And the thesis is devoted to the traditions dealing with the will of Sa'ad ibn Abi al-Waqqas. Uh, so Zaman uh, collected a corpus of more than 100 traditions, and he studied very carefully both their isnads and their matans. And uh, his study of the matans of this tradition is particularly remarkable uh, because he studies the matan at several levels of composition, individual expressions, motifs, and finally, 
he studies also the stylistic um, structure of the mountains. So it is a very complex and in-depth analysis. Uh, maybe the problem with his dissertation is that uh, he avoids making definite conclusions and leaves it to the reader to make such conclusions by following the text. And the text, I must admit, is difficult to read because the analysis is very complex and uh, uh, difficult to follow uh, even for the specialist. So uh, what, uh, what Zaman proposed, he, he termed his method the new science of Rijal, so the new science of transmitters. Uh, this is not so catchy a uh, title for his, for his method, but uh, uh, hopefully his dissertation is going to be finally published. Uh, we are awaiting this uh, because it is a pity that um, it, uh, it didn't gain uh, wide circulation. Now, during the last two decades, uh, it's not Komatan analysis was used by a great number of Hadith scholars. In the following, I shall touch upon two main challenges before it's not Komatan analysis, of course, for a uh, much more detailed version, uh, you may wish to see uh, the uh, large version of my study which is uploaded to the shared folder. Now, the first, uh, the first challenge that we face uh, is the single strand is not. When one looks at the Isnat diagram of any given tradition, one quickly observes the existence of many Isnats that pass through a single line of successive transmitters without branches at any level of transmission. So here, this is a single strand Isnat, this is another single strand, and this one is a third single strand. Schacht dismissed such isnats below the common link level as unhistorical. So to Schacht, this part of the tradition is unhistorical. Yainbo extended Schacht's criticism to the single strand isnats above the common link level. And he developed a typology of such chains. Some of the single strands may flank the common link connecting with the lower tire of transmission. In Jainbo's terminology, this is not flanking the common link, are called dives. And he even, he even differentiated between shallow dive and deep dive. So the shallow dive is connecting with a transmitter immediately below the common link level, whereas the deep dive goes much deeper to a much earlier transmitter. Both dives to Yainbo are unhistorical, they are inventions, and uh, the shallow dive is uh, a, an earlier invention, and the deep dive is a later invention because uh, there was a competition to find the highest is not. <clears throat> Furthermore, Yangbo observed the existence of is not bundles that consist exclusively of single strands. So this is Yangbo's famous spider. As a multiplication of the single strand phenomenon, the spider does not inspire, according to Yenbo, any measure of credence. We cannot be sure whether uh, any of these isnads is uh, bearing witness to the historicity of transmission by the key figure, because basically anyone 
of these transmitters at any level may have copied the other. <clears throat> Against Schacht and Jainball, Motsky defended the single strand by a swarm of arguments, mostly hypothetical. Insofar as its detractors availed themselves of the argument that in a culture of widespread hadith transmission, the single strand is not would be the exception rather than the rule, Motsky directed his criticism at this very postulate. In his view, the common links were the first, quote, systematic collectors, unquote, of, of traditions. When asked to name their informant, they would choose the most reliable chain of transmission. Apart from this, many alternative isnads may have fallen into oblivion. This is with regard to, if we come back to this diagram, so this part of the isnad was rejected by Schacht and Yenbo, whereas Motsky argued that the common link is actually the first systematic collector who collected material from this informant. Above the, co the common link level, the single strands are explained by such factors as the desire of individual transmitters to have their own chains of transmission. So it's uh, better to have one's own chain of transmission than citing one's colleague. Also, the geographical seclusion of some traditionists. The pre also, the presumption that not all students became teachers themselves. So one, t one teacher may have had many students, but not all of them became transmitters. And also, Motsky argued that uh, a number of early collections may have been lost. And these collections may have included isnats on the authority of early key figures. So let's say there may have been some collections uh, citing this successor, but they were lost. And therefore, we end up with a single strand isnat. Motsky's positive stance towards the single strand isnats fanning out from the common link is conditionally justified. His defense of the single strand below the common link here is less convincing. The main issue here is that the Isnad institution came into being during the second civil war in Islam between 60 and 73 Hijra, 680-692 common era. And uh, it became a methodological desideratum only at the end of the second 8th century. In other words, even if we, if we adopt Motsky's lenient take on the issue of Isnat authenticity, at best, we will be able to reach the end of the first 7th century. Now to the second and more formidable challenge. How to reconstruct the archetype tradition? Because we are dealing not simply with isnats. We are interested in the text of the traditions. Isnat kumatn analysis is done from above to below. The analyst starts with the variance present in extant collections. So there is a given set of extant collections. The larger they no their number, the better. The collector, the collector texts are then compared. So we compare collector five with four um, with this transmitter also. And we try to reconstruct the wording of the partial common link. But we bear in mind that we do not have any collection by the partial common link. So we are going from 
um, going from above to below. If we are lucky, we can, we can reconstruct the partial common link wording here and here. Then we repeat the procedure. We compare the wording of the two partial common links and if we are still lucky, we may reconstruct the common link wording. Now, my experience with Isnat Kumak analysis shows that Martin comparison usually yields increasing, increasing textual differences at each lower level of reconstruction. Regardless of the types of traditions that we study, the common link version is clouded in textual uncertainty. How are we to, to assess the textual differences? Yainbo occasionally paid attention to the Matten wording, but careful Matten analysis became the hallmark of the method inaugurated by Zaman and Motsky. In his publications, Motsky frequently discusses the Matten differences. Without setting out specific criteria for their assessment, Motsky explains such differences by two methodological postulates. Either the later transmitters introduced changes to the source text, or the source text was narrated in several variants by its original transmitter. In like manner, Gregor Schöler argued that a considerable degree of difference is expected in the early historical reports because they came to the later collectors by way of oral transmission, which, being a recollection about <coughs> recollection, lacks the fixed form of the written record. Motsky's unqualified rehabilitation of the single strand is not, combined with, the, with his all-inclusive principle of textual similarity, or dissimilarity, if you will, produced an unfalsifiable method. It let later Hadith analysts operating under the aegis of Isnat Kumat analysis to often led them to an uncritical acceptance of all Isnats issuing from a certain key figure based on the premises that, first, the ISNAT system is accurate even in its earliest chains. Hence, second, a vague similarity in wording, in wording is sufficient to prove a transmission authentic even when confined to a bundle of single strands. Let me give a short example by a very good and in-depth publication by Nicolette Boechhoff van der Voort, recent publication uh, in which she studied a number of traditions about the prophet's intended will, uh, which was suppressed somehow by his, uh, by his uh, companions. Uh, perhaps uh, he was talking about Kalala, I don't know. <laughs> now, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in her in-depth study, Boeho van der Voort defends the Isnat ascription to the companion Ibn Abbas. From several citations in much later sources, she infers that Ibn Abbas's narration included four motifs. These motifs are denuded of textual substance to a degree that tells us nothing specific about what Ibn Abbas would have related to his students. Did the event happen on Thursday or on another day of the week? How many people were present around the Prophet's deathbed? Did he... 
Did the prophet ask those present to bring him an ink pot and a piece and a piece of paper, or a shoulder blade, or a document, kitab? Did he command his companions to expel the mushrikun from Arabia and to provide water for the delegations or not? The proposed motives ostensibly validate this not evidence, but at the same time they make us unable to reconstruct the wording of Ibn Abbas's tradition, and in the end they raise doubts that such a tradition ever existed in Ibn Abbas's lifetime. Not surprisingly, with the progress of her analysis, Boyhov van der Voort grows uncertain that the attribution to Ibn Abbas can be confirmed. By the way, I should add that uh, similar uncertainty can be observed in, uh, in uh, Motsky's latest, last publication uh, about uh, a number of exegetical traditions associated with a, an obscure person, Muhammad ibn Abi Muhammad, uh, who according to Motsky was the informant of Muhammad ibn Ishaq with these traditions. So uh, uh, these traditions are associated with Ibn Abbas, but uh, Motsky is careful um, and uh, reluctant to, um, to claim that the Isnat below Muhammad Ibn Abi Muhammad really goes back to uh, Ibn Abbas, and uh, his conclusion is that these are rather later exegetical elaborations. So uh, uh, it must be said that when Motsky comes to the first century Hijra, he is very careful not to overstate his evidence. Now, to sum up. In the foregoing survey, I observed two divergent tendencies. If we grant the reliability of the Isnad system as a whole, Nothing will stand in the way of early dating of traditions. Based on this presumption, the Hadith scholar will be able to go well into the first 7th century, including the lifetime of the Prophet and his companions. To its detriment, this approach is unable to reconstruct the text of traditions as they were circulated by the first generations of Muslims except for phantom motives lacking textual substance. By contrast, a successful reconstruction of a fixed, meaningful text at each lower level of transmission, transmission undercuts our ability to maintain early chronologies of traditions. At its best, such a text-centric method can validate the transmission sometime into the first half of the second 8th century. Thus, modern-day hadith analysis appears to have run into a fundamental barrier that we may call a principle of uncertainty. The more credence we profess in the ascription to early authorities, the less able we are to reconstruct the wording of these authorities. And the more able we are to reconstruct the Matan wording, the less credence we can lend to its ascription to early authorities. The stringent text-oriented approach that I have advocated here may seem skeptical, inasmuch as it rules out the dating of traditions into the first 7th century. We may only guess about the propagators of early hadith who became the informants of the earliest common links. Granting that such propagators existed, we may still hope to retrieve some information going back to the later part of the first 7th century. Below the common link threshold is not Kumatan analysis falters not least because the Isnat came into being in Kufa during the Second Civil War in Islam. The first 7th century studies need a different method. I'm 
not here to argue against uh, the possibility of studying the first century. Of course, it is possible, and we have seen here uh, a number of approaches based of alternative of uh, alternative witnesses. Uh, and uh, as uh, Sean Anthony has uh, shown in his uh, later mon latest monograph, uh, there is even a possibility to compare Muslim hadith with. Uh, uh, with external non-Muslim written traditions or written reports. It is, of course, poss of course possible. Uh, another example would be uh, the famous uh, hadith that uh, the swords are the keys to paradise, which seems to have uh, uh, parallels in non-Muslim sources. So, of course, the possibility uh, to study the first century is here. Now, uh, to sum up, to conclusion, to sum up the outstanding achievements, failures, and desiderata of his not combat analysis, uh, we should give up the hope that is not combat analysis can date textually fixed matins into the first seventh century. The method is undoubtedly useful for the study of traditions from the second, eighth century onwards. The archetype tradition should be reconstructed as a concrete and meaningful text. Positing notional texts without a fixed wording does not yield positive knowledge about the archetype tradition nor does it prove its existence. The single strand is not, is of limited utility. It may be cautiously used above the common link level only when accompanied with partial common link transmissions. So if we return here, to me, the single strand is not, which is flanked by partial common links, may be used as a textual witness. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pavel. And the floor is open for uh, comments and questions. Rich and really heavy presentation. Um, very, very educating because you started from um, the hadith critics, the classical hadith critics, and you gave us, you know, like a tour um, in the development of uh, the methodology, which is really fascinating. And I prepared like 10 questions because I read the full version of your article, but we will leave it to our correspondence and uh, discussions later. And my, my two observations observations, uh, I think they boil, do boil down to, to a single question, which is, what do we take or what do we need to take from the classical hadith critics? Because I, I deal only with theological hadith and the fact whether Ibn Abbas said or didn't say, it, it doesn't bother me. But what I see is that um, the classical hadith critics, they do have a lot to say about the authenticity of the material. And so in Isnad Kum Matan analysis, as I see it, you, you take the, the versions of the hadith, you take, you, you analyze the, the Isnads, the various Isnads, you analyze or you try to take uh, narratological motifs and, but where, where is the component, I think the crucial component of the observations of later scholars from the Mamluk period, for example, uh, Shams al-Din al-Zahabi is really critical. Do we take him into consideration when we do this Isnat Kum analysis methodology? This is one question. The other question is about Yain Bull. I think people here know him personally or knew him personally. Uh, I didn't. I just discovered his uh, encyclopedia of canonical hadith like 
10 years ago, and uh, I, I found uh, uh, the book very useful. But now, what you say here is that, in fact, his skepticism or criticism make, make him obsolete, uh, as far as I, I understand, or maybe, maybe I didn't understand, maybe he's not that skeptical. Um, so these are my two questions. And thank you again. Uh, thank you, Levnat, for these questions. Uh, of course, Adahabi is a major scholar, and uh, his uh, studies are important, uh, as well as Ibn Jawzi uh, and his, uh, uh, his works, uh, the Mawdu'at issue, and so forth. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I wouldn't uh, like to leave the impression that I'm suggesting to uh, to disregard such contributions. Of course, they are uh, very important. Um, and uh, the reason that uh, they are not included here is first because uh, the exposition will, would have grown even bigger. And secondly, uh, because, uh, uh, because I'm dealing only with ISNAT and Matten analysis, uh, so I wanted to focus on the earliest instances of ISNAT analysis, and my intention is to show that uh, modern ISNAT criticism uh, in, so to say, Western academia is uh, mainly based on what have already been achieved by the Muslim uh, Hadith critics and even the earliest ones. So if we go back to Ibn al-Madini, uh, uh, we can see that the common links, so to say, are here. Although he says, Yaduru al-Isnadu ala, and lists these persons, and although no term uh, madar has entered the terminology of Muslim hadith critics, uh, uh, but Yainbo has, in fact, a publication uh, uh, in which he draws also comparisons between the methodology and terminology of uh, Muslim hadith critics from the earliest period and the hadith criticism uh, of uh, uh, the 19th and the 20th century, uh, including, uh, I didn't talk about this, but also uh, including these dives about which he speaks. Uh, uh, actually, uh, they may be related to Ibn Salah's uh, taxonomy of uh, high isnats. Uh, I have a chapter in the larger version of my study. So, of course, they did a lot. Uh, what modern uh, isnat and matin analysis does is to introduce um, to introduce text critical uh, studies. Uh, I even suggest several criteria as well, which are of course not my own uh, invention. They have been around for quite a long time. Uh, so uh, we, we must study carefully the ISNAD. Mm, of course, uh, the importance of reconstructing the tradition mm, even uh, in exegesis is that even subtle differences may be informative about the later development. I give an example in the bigger file uh, with a tradition uh, which Kramas dated to the time of the prophet. And according to him, this tradition uh, has a Manichaean trait. And he reconstructs two versions of the Matan. One says, La yatil khayru bisharri. And the other says, La yatil khayru illa bil khayri. They seem to be similar. But when we study the Isnads, we quickly, quickly, quickly discover that the expression La yatil khayru bisharri. Be 
is associated with the Basran scholar Hisham ad dastuai And Hisham ad dastuai was a Qadari. And the concept of Qadar at that time was that God creates the good, whereas man is responsible for the bad or for the evil. And here we have the assertion, la ya'til khayru bisharri, God is good, and he doesn't bring up any evil. Whereas the other formulation, la ya'til khayru illa bil khayri, is associated with Sufyan ibn Uyayna, who was a predestinarian. And now, here we may see an attempt to suppress the mention of evil. So, la ya'til khayru illa bil khayri. God creates only good things, but the, somehow the bad is not uh, mentioned, and therefore there is no association with the agent of bad. Uh, so uh, here we can see how very subtle differences in the Martin formulation may be indicative of different theological agendas. Uh, yes, uh, Yain Bo, uh, to your second question. Uh, I think that Yain Bo's skepticism about the single strand Isnad was overdone. But let us not forget that he was replying to Michael Cook's criticism of Van Esse's method in uh, his uh, 1975 book, Zwischen uh, Hadith uh, on Theology. Uh, and there, uh, uh, Van Es massively used Isnat and Matten analysis. So, uh, Yengo had to take into account uh, Cook's criticism. And what he did was to outrightly reject the single strand Isnat because Cook basically he, he said that uh, if we uh, happen to find an Isnat connecting here, like this one, we should shift the dating earlier. And that's why Yainbo, responding to Cook, disbelieves these so-called dives. So uh, Yainbo must be, also, always he must be taken into, in, in a context. Uh, he shouldn't be treated out of, uh, of his context. And secondly, he is not uh, so skeptical by the way he dates traditions into the first century and into the time, lifetime of the prophet, uh, based on two criteria. First uh, is his typology of traditions, uh, in which he considers the qissa, qasas, to be the earliest, uh, the earliest uh, uh, type of traditions, uh, which he uh, thinks were circulated into the first in, in the first century. And secondly, uh, he has the inverted common link. Uh, this is a person, uh, let's say this one, in whom several earlier Isnads converge. So he thinks that this is a collector. And here, here is also this overlaps with, with Motsky's later thesis that the, the common links were the collectors of traditions. So Yenbo is not that skeptical, although uh, somehow he is notorious for his uh, so-called skepticism. I wonder how would you evaluate the material which we find in the Mauduat collections? Because in the Mauduat collections we find sometimes explicit statements that when people found an idea which was acceptable to them, they appended to it uh, and it's not. So, as you said in the beginning of your talk, we, us we usually have the impression that the classical commentators dealt with the Isnat only. But in the Mauduat collections, we have an explicit admission that uh, the Isnat was forged as frequently as anything else. 
Well, this, this is a continuation uh, to me of the classical approach, uh, which is uh, to study the Isnad in conjunction with the Matan. Uh, but in the Maldu'at collection, uh, we usually, uh, well, uh, the classical hadith, they usually do with additions or simple changes of the wording which do not amount to a falsification of the tradition. In the Maldu'at collection, uh, we have a more Matan-centric criticism uh, which uh, uh, takes issue with uh, traditions which are either uh, logically inconsistent or, or which are uh, biased uh, to a specific madhab uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, they, uh, even in this case, this is my impression uh, that uh, in the Maldu'at collections, they still associate um, the Matan problem with an Isnat problem. Because uh, it is uh, difficult to argue that uh, a tradition which is logically inconsistent on, uh, or which is preposterous is nevertheless carried by a sound is not this would be this would be impossible uh, but uh, I'm sorry for not going into a greater detail uh, because I am not so well versed in the Maldu'at collections thank you Pavel thank you testing thank you Pavel that was a uh, very clear uh, uh, presentation of a very complex um, method that's used and uh, you know most uh, scholars in Islamic studies come across hadith in one way or another in their uh, research uh, probably the majority of them aren't interested in whether or not it was authentic or it isn't important whether or not it was authentic. But then there are many for whom it is important whether or not it is authentic. Within that group, few of them are going to be able to master this method. And so uh, my question is, uh, well, is uh, uh, would it be useful to think of developing an app that would uh, um, allow, make it possible to insert, you know, keywords of a hadith or a hadith, and then the app would do all of this work and generate um, the chart and allow the scholar then to, you know, uh, work with it and see what what the results are. Uh, well, this is already an issue of digital humanities and. Uh, such approaches are, to my knowledge, they are um, uh, into development uh, right now. So uh, uh, I attended uh, two weeks ago a very interesting seminar at Exeter University uh, where they study Shi Hadith by the means of, uh, digital, of digital humanities and um, uh, I listened to a, uh, an interesting talk by uh, Marusia Bednarkevich from uh, the University of Tübingen. Uh, so she tried to use some, uh, well, I'm, I'm not, I, I wouldn't dare repeating the terminology, but there, were, there was a Python or something like that. <laughs> Uh, I'm completely ignorant <laughs> about these matters. So she showed actually a um, diagram uh, drawn by a computer. But uh, still she said uh, there, they, there were many challenges before computerizing this, uh, uh, this job, the, the technical job. Uh, but uh, she makes... Uh, uh, quite uh, uh, impressive uh, advances in, in, in this field. So uh, she showed us several diagrams, but I would say that this one is uh, 
so is better and more beautiful, so to say, compared to the computerized diagram, but I'm sure that in 10 years, let's say, uh, computer digital technologies would allow us, uh, would facilitate our job. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I can't imagine how we can program the computer to sense the subtle differences in the Martin formulation. So how can we teach the computer to make the difference between la ya'ti al-khayru bil-sharri and la ya'ti al-khayru illa bil-khayri and to somehow to, to be aware that both these formulations should be uh, put in a single diagram or uh, for instance, the prophet wants to say something uh, and uh, the people don't hear him. Is it Kalala? Is it another thing? How can we teach the computer? Uh, but uh, I'm not the computer guy, so uh, I still rely on my limited human uh, capabilities. Thank you.